Today, um, we are doing a um, book club type of roundtable. This is the first time we've done something like this, um, where an article has been selected and um, ideally you guys would have read it and then come ready to discuss, but we're teachers. We know that doesn't always happen. So you actually don't have to have read the article in order to participate in today's session. Um, I'm going to show a bunch of quotes and we're going to talk about SEL um, as it relates to the work we do in writing centers and learning centers. Uh, my name is Melissa Morgan and I run the learning center at West Springfield High School. So I do all subjects at my school. And well, I don't. My tutors do. I manage it. Um, but we did start as a writing center. So <clears throat> We are uh, very well established in those practices. Um, if you need to access the article to follow along, the quotes I'm gonna go through are from there, um, but I will be projecting them on the screen. Again, we have the chat open for those of you online. Please feel free to comment and to participate. We have two screens in here. I know you can't see it online. One of them is the chat. So just a little heads up. Um, <laughs> Should you send something, you are projecting to the whole room, the whole room being all six of us, okay? So um, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay. Oh, I am screen sharing. What I want to do is, yes. Oh, yep. I am, I want to go back to my slide deck. No. Wait. Yes. Okay. So before we jump in, um, I did tell Amber Jensen, who is our one of our lowly editors for the journal Peer Tutoring in Secondary Schools, where this article is from, that I would do a little brief, like, you should publish, you should write. It's great. And it, and it really is. So if you are unfamiliar, I know we've talked <clears throat> We've talked a lot about it, um, this conference, but this is the journal for peer tutoring in secondary schools. It is full of wonderful resources and articles. Don't feel like you have to buy it. It is available online, but if you would like a hard copy, um, they are available on Amazon. A little $10. bit, oh, $10? Okay, $10, not bad. Um, <clears throat> A little bit about publishing in the journal. It's something I've had experience with both having something published and as a peer reviewer. It is such a great way to, to kind of share what it is you've been doing in your centers. Um, we have a bunch of different types of articles that we are looking for. Voices from the center articles, which are just simple narratives, um, tutor articles, practitioner articles. We're, the article we're looking at today is a practitioner article. Um, and then there are the more in-depth research articles. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the SWACA website backslash journal. Um, you can talk to conference attendees with the little blue flag on their badge to learn more. Um, and for those of you in person, Susan Frank is actually presenting about publishing in the journal in this room right after this. So you can also just hang out here to learn more. All right, um, down here on the table, for those of you in person, we are raffling off some journals. So if you would like, feel free to, we have our call for submissions, we have stickers, we have flyers, but we also have a little raffle slip for you guys, okay? Sorry, virtual people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so today's article was written by Stephanie Beanie from, and Stephanie, if you're on, I, I hope, I said your name right, <laughs> um, but, um, and it is the High School Writing Center as a center for social emotional learning. This was published in the fall um, 2021 issue of SWACA. And so the way this is gonna go is I'm going to project some quotes that I pulled from Stephanie's article that I thought would foster great discussion. And um, we can talk about what, she discussed in the article, but also make connections to our own centers, whether learning centers or writing centers, about how we are fostering social emotional learning um, or how we could start incorporating that into our centers. So before we jump into those quotes, um, I wanted to share what Stephanie outlined um, 
as the social emotional competencies. And this was taken from the collaborative for academic social and emotional learning. Um, if you're an educator, you're probably quite familiar with CASEL, but these are the five elements that um, our conversations and our quotes will surround. So that's self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. Notice that none of these have to do with academics. So we're not talking about the academic work that we do in our centers. Um, instead, we're going to be talking about the, uh, again, the social emotional work we do in our centers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think I did not, I, I knew Lisa Zimarelli was presenting when I chose this article. I did not know that her opening address would connect so well with what we're going to discuss today. Um, the opening, opening line of um, Stephanie's article here says, what powers academics in high school? The answer seems louder than ever, relationships. So if you attended the opening address yesterday, you'll know that that is kind of what it's centered around, this idea of accompaniment. So if you were in attendance for that, think about making connections to that as well. Um, the quotes are gonna go in order of appearance in the article. And this quote here um, comes from, let's see, I wanna see if I can find it in the article for those of you referencing it. It is at the bottom of the second paragraph um, where, Stephanie introduced the five uh, competencies of social emotional learning. And she said, these skill areas are not, not only impact an individual, that should have been an and, not an and, uh, learning center, not writing center, guys, an individual student's approach to learning, but they can also play a critical role in growing a positive school community that values respect, trust, and kindness among its members. So I want you to think what might this look like in the writing or learning center? And again, comment in the chat. Those of you just feel free to chime out in person and you're welcome to take a little bit of think time as you, as you process this. Yes, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide, uh, those of you online, just so we can review. While this is up, that quote again is these skills, skill areas not only impact an individual student's approach to learning, but they can also play a critical role in growing a positive school community that values respect, trust, and kindness among its members. I see some of you writing that down. I'll give you a couple minutes, I'll give you a couple seconds. But what does that look like in our centers or what could it look like in our centers? And I'm happy to go first while you guys are thinking and processing. Yeah, Rebecca. So in the past we've had, um, not only our normal academic tutors, but we've also had time management tutors who were more senior students and who you know, had a real good handle on how to use a calendar, how to, you know, um, kind of when they're getting major <clears throat> assignments, how to sort of break those down into smaller pieces for themselves if the instructors haven't done that. And, you know, and plan accordingly. And so that speaks to sort of fostering that self-management, I think, and mm -hmm. also maybe just self-awareness. We've been focusing a lot in our center and um, in the work we do, especially with the, our younger middle school students on fostering those executive function skills. Um, and we've been holding town halls for parents as well to support um, them in supporting their students. So that um, just maybe think it kind of connects to those first two social emotional uh, competencies. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, so I think this is definitely something that we've tried to do many ways in our writing center. We're at a high school, um, but just to kind of make the community a little more at ease and a little more aware in a in a 
kind of safe, safer feeling way, a less vulnerable way maybe than a lot of students feel going into the writing center. Um, and one idea to share with you all is we started doing um, twice a year now a game night um, that we put on and we just have four games and we do have information about the writing center. We've only done it three times so far. So we're still like working on the method for it. Um, but it's been really popular. Kids want to just come and play games and have fun and tying it to the writing center, I feel like is a nice thing for everybody. So it's kind of like a writing center sponsored event. Yes. Okay. I really like that. Um, yeah, in the back. Where I like that we just did a freshman history course, like our great career. So in our school library, because it's very important. Oh, that's wonderful. So for, oh yeah, go ahead. I was thinking about this in terms of training because we do a lot of training with our peer tutors. Sure. The development of them moving at risk through earlier. The idea of self awareness and social awareness, right? Relationship skills. And just, especially for newer tutors, is the younger kids, we have middle school and high school um, peer tutors. And just basic, you know, interactions or initial interactions when you're working with someone for the first time, you know, maybe have a script sometimes that we suggest, you know, here's maybe an opener for you, right? Or some things that we were talking about yesterday at the keynote, thinking about how do you deal with situations where maybe someone is not as forthcoming uh, in terms of describing the issues that you're working on. Also, thinking about for a lot of our tutors who've been tutors for three, four, five years, mm -hmm. they have uh, developed relationships. We talked about here in the quote, right? And thinking about how have they become successful in that way. We share also. Uh, and a lot of the training sessions where we'll have some more senior tutors or TAs who come in and talk about strategies that work for them. And so, at least within the, the immediate community, if you will, of the peers of the tutoring center, right, for the writing tutoring center for us, um, that being sort of a smaller microcosm of the community and the way in which they react or interact with the larger community. Wonderful. That's awesome. So um, I see we have some comments online. And for those of you who may not have been able to hear those conversations that we've been having in here, some of the things we talked about um, were um, having tutors who are designed to specifically help students with things like time management, like scheduling, whether that be using an agenda that might look like that, or maybe chunking or working through a long assignment. I know that's something I've also used in my center as well. Um, we've talked about center, um, basically centered, sponsored community building events. Um, and that could be, um, center related. Um, one of our members here talked about hosting just a center game night, just to kind of put everybody at ease and kind of hang out and socialize and leave that academic component behind. But then we have another guest here who talked about how their center, they have nights against procrastination where they just kind of invite everybody in. It's a big anti-procrastination party with pizza and you just sit down and, and you do that work you've been putting off. We've all been there. Um, and then um, this idea of building community within the center um, among the tutors themselves kind of having, it sounded, and I could be wrong, correct me, like almost like a mentor mentee tutor situation where um, the tutors are kind of these more experienced tutors are um, kind of help guide and teach and instruct and build relationships with these newer tutors. And then we can see on the chat, thank you, Lisa. Um, she works with students to understand their unique writing habits and look for ways to tweak those habits to improve writing processes. So yeah, if we want to loop in that academic side, absolutely. Um, getting them to look at their what their weaknesses might be as writers and giving them those strategies to overcome those weaknesses. I always tell in my center, we want people to come to the center, but we also wanna get them to the point where they can do the assignments on their own. Um, ideally, then they come back to us with help for other work, um, but we're really wanting to build that independence. And Lisa, I think that really speaks to that. Thank you, everyone. 
So then the next um, <clears throat> quote that stood out to me is this idea of multi-tiered systems of supports. And I know at least in my school, we actually have an MTSS specialist. I know not all schools, probably many schools do not. So this is a little overview of what MTSS is. It's something that's really popular right now, um, connecting SEL and academics together. And so a definition of MTSS is on the screen. It gives every student a tier one, tier two, tier three rating in academic behavior and attendance areas. The system then, okay, I did this last night when I was real tired, guys. I am so sorry. I just, yeah. Anyways, assigns a level of support and one overall MTSS tier designation with tier three as highest and tier one as lowest, okay? Um, I think in my school writing centers, depending on the student, it can be a tier one, tier two intervention. We are kind of used as a writing, as an intervention at high school. Um, so how can writing and learning centers support the MTSS in, in our schools or what role might our centers play in the MTSS system? This multi-tier system of support. Yeah, Stacey. Um, this actually speaks to me a lot because the, the previous center that I was at, uh, they used this as leverage for starting the center. And so it was originally called the RTI system, the response to intervention, mm -hmm. but then it moved to this MTSS system, um, right? Because the writing center is a tier one support would support the entire student body. And so that was actually just a way to convince administration and other stakeholders that this is a system for everyone mm -hmm. um, and that the center should exist because of it. And so not a, uh, a, a positive, well, it's a positive thing, but it's like a marketing yeah. thing. That's how we It is. It. it totally is a marketing type thing. Um, and I like that you brought up RTI, response to intervention, because I think for those of us who've been in it for a while, that's kind of what this was. And then we realized there is a social emotional component to it. And so we started to fold in and now we have multi-tiered. Um, and it is, it's a great, like, this is one way, this is one reason we should start um, a learning center. Or if you find yourself in the unfortunate position where administration is like, should we keep it? Should we not keep it? This is an excellent reason as to why you should keep it. I know in my center, although I wasn't there for the transition from a writing center to a learning center, administration came to our director and said, this is a tier one intervention. We want to open it up to more than just writing. And so that's how we became the all subject center we are today. Any other thoughts? Yes, Stephanie, yes. So um, she said it is the reason her district started writing and math centers. And um, interestingly enough, I was just talking just casually with someone before this um, <clears throat> at the registration table. And since we've made the transition from a writing center to a learning center and all subject center, um, actually math is what we support the most my tutors. And then English is secondary. So that's kind of an interesting shift. I am an English teacher. So if you find yourself in that position, yes, you can. You can be a director of a center that does math. Yes, you can. <laughs> Any other thoughts before I bring up the next quote? I would, I guess I'd have a question for the person online who yeah. last comment about um, how they prioritize the students in their practice. Um, and especially, I guess, in, in ways that support without sort of stigmatizing them. Mm -hmm. Oh, she got it. <laughs> I guess I'm sitting close enough. <laughs> so in case you don't have as good of ears as, as Stephanie does. <laughs> I typed it in the chat, so we'll we'll wait for her response and take some comments while we're waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So Stephanie, I don't I don't know if you could hear this one because it was a little farther back, but how do you get these students or attract these students who are reticent? Um, so as you're typing your response, because I assume you're furiously typing, <laughs> I can chime into that. Um, I know at my school, 
Um, even before we transitioned to a learning center, um, <clears throat> a relationship was set up between the, the writing center and our ESOL department. We were able to get, they have a strategies for success class um, for these L students. And um, we were able to talk to administration about lining those two class periods up. And so then the tutors could then push into that strategies for success class. And it was only like, I mean, it was probably anywhere from like two to six students in a class of probably 15 to 18. So not everybody needed a tutor. Um, but one of the greatest things we did, I think that helps, especially related to SEL is um, we would help them with their English conversation. So they would come in and help train my tutors. And then my tutors would push in to work on English conversation, but also other academic needs. Uh huh. And it gets even better. It's even more fantastic because what I found is as we continued this program a few years into it, I started to get applicants to my program who were these former L students in these strategies for success classes who could then come in. And so then I literally had an expert tutor who could also help guide and talk to these tutors who are new to the country, new to the language and say, hey, I've been in your shoes. I know what this is like. Um, and these are students who wouldn't ordinarily have come to the center on their own um, for all kinds of reasons, right? And so we were able to really build that relationship with them. And it is, I think, one of the most fantastic things. All credit to Jenny Hornson for starting that. <laughs> um, okay, yes, Stephanie. Okay, yeah, a supported study hall. Yeah. Okay. So you meet with the coaches and it really does kind of become, it sounds like that intervention period for students. And as we know, as you get to know students very well, you really do start to build those relationships and let them know that this is a safe place. And also you are not a bad student. I think, I, I don't remember what session, I think, no, it was in the keynote when Lisa said, when her students come into her and she said, this is supposed to be hard. This is going to be hard, but we're gonna get through it together. And I think that really speaks to kind of what you were saying here, Stephanie. So thank you. Okay, we have about, oh no, we still have time. This is the 45, yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let me go back to my slide deck and we'll go to the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> So switching gears from MTSS to this idea of community, a strong sense of community is at the heart of teaching. I think we all know that, but how the pieces fit together can seem complicated. And Stephanie, one of the things I love for people who didn't read the article, I encourage you to go and read it. You addressed what some of these challenges are, especially towards the end of your article and realizing that this is the ideal. It's not um, something we're going to achieve overnight. Um, I think we kind of touched on this with like our procrastination night, our game nights, but are there any other ways that centers can foster community in their school or what role does community play in your center or, or in your school? So we'll give some time to think about that. While you're thinking, one of the reasons this quote really spoke to me is I feel like in the past, we've done a really good job of building community among our tutors in our center. I think we have a lot of great resources and activities to do that. I think for me as a director, an area of need is expanding that community into the school. And my current center is going under some, some changes where we work up course, we're now a club, and I'm trying to refigure what, what does that look like now? And what I've seen as I've made this shift, I've actually been able to engage in the school community a lot more as a club than I ever did as a course. And I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, there are strengths and weaknesses to both. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the course is what's more familiar to me, but it does make me think if I were to go back as a course, what would I take from my experience running this as a club to, to my course to engage more in this school community? Um, because it's really, it's up to us to make sure our program is running and that we are getting out 
there, as opposed to when it was a course, it was just kind of for taken for granted that it would be there, that it would be there next year. And so things that my tutors have talked about are things like engaging them in the social media aspect of, which I think a lot of centers do, doing things like tutor bios. Um, they've talked about doing things like weekly trivia with, with a raffle prize. Um, a March Madness situation with, I don't know, study skills, or I liked in one session I was in yesterday, they talked about different words, um, that kind of thing, and really making our presence known in the school. Yeah, Stacey. Um, so I have a thought with this, and definitely it's specific to my school, but we have a lot of kids that like to skip. Uh, this made me think of a presentation that I heard yesterday um, from Tyler Gardner, I believe, who was at the University of Provo, and when he has his tutors that aren't tutoring, they have like other things that they could be doing. Um, <clears throat> and I wondered if one of those things, because my center will run during the school day, would be like talking to the office or talking to our hall monitors and finding those kids who are wandering the hallway skipping and like sending a tutor there to kind of chat with that person. Yeah. Or even just like bring them into the center and have this little conversation. That sort of a peer-to-peer -peer conversation of hey, just what's going on? So not even in, involved with writing, but really that SEL piece of how was your day? Why were you skipping? Um, and that because if the tutor is not helping anyone in that moment, yeah, then that that's like brainstorming an idea for me as a way that we could reach out to the larger community and then also have those kids know that we are a presence for them so yeah presence and not purely an academic i'm failing i think that's really interesting because i think um as centers regardless of of what if it's a learning center or a writing center we're constantly thinking how can we engage the other content areas mm -hmm. right we spend a lot of time thinking about that but that's only part of part of the equation right especially if we go back to that mtss model um <clears throat> that there is this whole other attendance side, not that we become like truant officers in the hallway, but really building that connection, finding those friends in the hallway, encouraging them to come. Because I know at least in my school, we have staff who do that, right? They are meant to be these relationship builders. And that's awesome. You want kids to have good relationships with adults in the building, but you also want them to build good relationships with each other. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Like they're just continuing to not be in class. Correct. So here's how I, if I understood correctly, Stacy, um, it's more like this is your tutoring block, your class period to tutor. Yeah, and you aren't tutoring. So what could you do for it? Maybe you have some kind of like special hall pass or something to just kind of go out and just walk around, see who's in the hallway. Maybe you know someone, maybe you don't. Just say, hey, you know, where do you need to be? Have a, a five to 10 minute conversation with yeah. students and then like walk them to the class. But kind of that smaller interaction of how was your day? Because sometimes that's why kids get curious. They, do, they don't feel connected. Right, they right. Just need a little human connection before they can come back. I don't think my administration. <laughs> I think, and you couldn't hear online, so we had a great question. And you are a tutor, correct? Yeah. 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 So she was like, "If the person is out of class, skipping class, and the tutor isn't in class, don't we now just have two people outside of class?" <laughs> yes. We realize that this is an idea that would need some refining before it is presented to administration. So we just don't have a bunch of secondary students wandering the hallway. <laughs> yes, yes, creating their own community for better or for worse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know I have a meeting every month with my tutor peers and it's just kind of like a check in with them. Like what's, what writing is going on there? I, at our school, we're pretty, pretty disconnected right now. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I really depend on them to be like telling me what is going on. Um, and then always, you know, making sure that your tutors are reflective of the population as a whole. Yes. Every group, every yes. clique, every demographic um, in your center 
that's going to give you that diversity and a true reflection of what is going on in the school community. And, you know, I'm only one person in my school, and so I'm checking in with all of my tutors to kind of see what, what can we do, how can we do to the school as kind of business, what can we do to better yeah, I love that. And if you couldn't hear online, um, someone suggested, because she does this in her center, is meeting monthly with the tutor leadership and um, using them to figure out what kind of writing is going on in the school. What kind of support does the school need? How could we meet that need? And I think that's excellent. And what brings to mind is if any of you out there order or already have the SWACA toolkit, there actually are some specific assignments, uh, assignment ideas in there that kind of touch on that. Um, giving tutors specific roles to reach out to teachers in these other subjects, in other content areas. Um, I believe it's called the course liaisons project, or at least what we have at my school, that's what it's called. And um, that is a great way to get the tutors engaged and then let them, it's almost like a return and report situation. Um, and then coming up with a plan from there, because yes, like you said, we are only one person. And I say the exact same thing to my tutors. Like, there's no way I can know what's going on um, in the school. I really need you guys to do that. One of my tutors who was here with me yesterday, one of the things they said, they were so excited to be here. One of the things they said was, wow, I never realized how important those teacher needs on assignments. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let me tell you, going back to club versus course, that's a hard sell in a in a, in a club. It's a real hard sell in a club. So the yes. liaisons project document that's being referenced is actually available online for any Oh we may, okay, awesome. Resources. Great. So if you didn't hear that, it, that liaisons project is a digital resource from the SWACA toolkit. So you can find it there as well. And obviously tweak as needed. It's not a one size fits all, but it's a great place to start for kind of reaching out. And I have found that does help. It has helped build community in my school um, as we started implementing that, pro that program, that liaisons project. Okay, next quote. All right, so um, Stephanie provided us two student examples. One was Jasmine and one was Ada. And so if you didn't get to read, let me just tell you a little bit about both before I address the quote. So um, Jasmine is a student who, um, she was an MTSS assigned freshman. Um, and it says, I'll just read the passage. It says, during her attendance in the writing center each day, a troubling pattern emerged. Several days a week, Jasmine stayed with her father. She tended to be extremely tired in her first period and often fell asleep. Um, we learn an older brother lived at the father's house full time. Visitors were coming and going, which affected Jasmine's sleep and schoolwork, okay? The other student, Ada, um, she is a self-described antisocial person. Um, and it says Ada later sought, well, she was kind of hesitant. Well, okay. It says sophomore honor student named Ada found the writing center when her English teacher asked her to attend during remote learning. Um, although self-described as antisocial, Ada later sought one-to-one -one conferences, changing a single visit into a series of self-chosen ones when writing an essay for an entr entry to a prestigious um, academic organization. Um, she went from after her first visit at the writing center, Ada suffered an injury. Uh, she was very different, had different needs. Um, she started out very tentatively coming to the center. Um, she would not turn her camera on. I think something we're all familiar with is for virtual learning. Um, she sounded tired and unmotivated, but as she returned, um, rapport was built. It took several sessions and Stephanie, you said you were able to draw out and guide her own actions that eventually revealed that she was quite a good re writer. Like she was quite skilled in what she had to do. Um, so these were two great examples of how SEL rich tutoring practices can meet the needs of two very different students. Um, so how can we use these practices and empower our two T's or those attending our center to meet their own academic challenges?
Yes. It goes back to one of the points you had earlier on the bulletin list about social awareness. Yeah. And both from your perspective, uh, or just from a human perspective, where they don't automatically assume it's something horrible that they did or said in the meeting. They just try to, we always talk about meeting students where they are, right? Mm -hmm. Saying, well, if you don't make any prejudgments, I think this goes back also to the keynote speaker yesterday. Yes. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be a short meeting because that's just kind of where that person is for that day. Um, unless it's an extreme situation where they have certain behaviors that are a cause for concern for their physical mental concern, and you report that to you know to myself if I'm the director or the uh, coordinator the director or to a counselor. Just that's the first step. But if it's some more like you mentioned before, not wanting to be on camera or not being very talkative, that may just they have a bad day potential. So don't assume anything, you know, or just you know, ask basic questions and just try to have that basic interaction develop a relationship. In both cases, you're thinking about what, you know, if there's a, a long-term relationship that you're working towards development. We talk to students about that during training. Just yeah. Do you automatically feel comfortable when you meet someone for the first time? No, not really, especially if you put yourself in their position and you're having to ask for them. Right, or and you're not used to doing that. So just be open to whatever you know their immediate needs are. Try to meet that as much as possible, and just be polite and you know and welcoming as much as you can, and go from there. And hope that the next you know you build upon that idea and think about the relationship over the long term. But that takes a lot you know, in terms of social awareness for younger students, especially where they have to have a certain level of confidence in yes. themselves. And they also, you know, need to sort of balance that with again you know, being aware of the other person, but they might be being empathetic. Yes, thank you. Um, so what was brought up here, if you could not hear online, was this, um, I like that you brought in incorporating this into your tutor training. How do you deal with these individuals, right? And I like, I'm going to start asking this question. How do you feel when you meet someone new, right? Because that's essentially what's happening. And it's kind of this idea of, of the long game, right? Um, <clears throat> it, it will take time to to build these relationships and that's okay. And we need to remind our tutors of that. And I think it's also okay that tutor training is going to look different for everyone based on what the needs are of your school, the type of center you have, right? All subject or writing center, middle school or high school. Like I feel like upperclassmen could be more open to it. Middle schoolers might need a little more structure. They might need like role playing activities and things like that. Um, but it is definitely something that that is valuable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the needs you need one week as a student, if you need to write a one week, you're certainly going to hard time that week. Yeah. It's just that your needs are ever changing. Right, exactly. Um, I also, it kind of brings to mind the saying, um, you can't pour from an empty bucket also. Um, so what was brought up by actually a tutor was the, the very, how mental health can vary for students throughout the year. It's not consistent, right? It goes up and down. I think that's very normal of the human experience just with life. And you might have a great session with a tutor, a 2T one week and a not so great session the next week. And, and that's okay, right? It's, we, I remind my tutors, it's not a personal reflection of you, but you bringing that up also reminds me, I have a tutor and she's very open about her mental health and she will often have friends and acquaintances come to the center and um, they'll sit down and she will tell her 2T because they have this relationship already saying, just so you know, I had a really hard day today. So if, you know, I don't seem as bubbly, it's not you, it's, you know, I'm just processing something. And then her her friend, the 2T, is like, that's totally fine. I totally get that. I hope you're okay. And then they're able to launch into that assignment. Obviously, again, going back to this idea of the long game, that's not something that happens overnight. Yeah. I don't know if others are going to feel like this, but at least for us, it's really helpful to establish that. Um, just because we have a different schedule and know what is very constant in case of the and so it's hard to always figure out how to meet our two people there and they're not because we don't know each other's name. We just kind of find each other. 
Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that is not something that's unique to your center. Um, a tutor mentioned in here, you know, we want to meet two T's where they're at, but if however our program is structured, it doesn't match up to building those relationships, it's not always going to be conducive to that. And I do think that is a real challenge and struggle. And one thing that came to mind for me was um, that's where those community nights really come into play, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be the game night, the procrastination night, uh, study taking skills. If you're not going to be able to do that in your own, um, you know, just it's simply by how your center is structured, you will need to start looking for other ways to do that. And I think whole center activities are a great way to do that, pushing out into the community, um, because then students will start coming to you. You might only see them one or two times, but they'll start coming to you feeling more comfortable, right? They'll feel, feel more prepared. Um, so yes, Rebecca. So I was just gonna add to that. Um, we, you know, we often meet students and, you know, we're entirely online. And so there's not the opportunity to sort of grab students in the hallway or form those same kinds of connections. But we provide um, basically empathy training to our tutors and TAs too. And just to give them a sense and, and to hopefully remind them of this idea that, you know, you, you don't know what has gone on for students when they log into a session and giving them some language to use mm. to sort of initiate those conversations with empathy and how to address um, what might be roadblocks for the students, um, whether it's writer's block that they're encountering. Um, I think it goes a long way, I find, just in working one-on-one -on -one with students when towards the end of the appointment, you kind of take the time to summarize for them in writing um, and verbally what they are accomplishing, mm -hmm. you know, what they've done well, mm -hmm. and give them some key things to focus on. Um, and that might be, you know, taking a more directed strategy, of course, but if you have a student who's really struggling, sometimes, you know, the more directive approach can, um, is what, is what they need, you know, that I, like, I need to know what the next step is that I should accomplish, right? It yeah. gives them that sense of maybe confidence or something. Um, so those are some things that I feel just anecdotally have worked for me and that I, I hope will, you know, have, have been working for those that we've been training to. Yeah, I really like that. Thank you. I, it, What sparked in my mind was um, I trained my tutors to do, I'm sure tutors in here as well, uh, the compliment sandwich, right? What you did well, what could use improvement, but this is what you are doing well because you want your, your 2T to lead. But I like this idea of not being afraid to give directive steps um, that they could take. And I think we would need to explain to our 2Ts the difference between directive and corrective. Um, um, and so that I'm like, oh, how, how would I do that? What, how do I need to revise my training? But also I really loved your idea of empathy training because I think our tutors are really good at coming to us knowing, oh, our two T's have stepped in. They might be having a bad day. We don't know what's going on. They can be open-minded, but they don't necessarily have the language to communicate that. Um, and, and so that's another thing that kind of got me thinking. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for sharing that. Um, folks, we are out of time. Um, I, unfortunately, I only had like one or two more quotes. I have thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you all today about SEL. I have enjoyed in-person comments, the online comments. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. I'm so glad you could join us. Um, hopefully, we did your article justice. If you have not read the article, read it. It's really good. It's a short read. It's great for directors. It's great for tutors. And it just, it makes you think about um, a whole other side of writing centers and learning centers that I feel like sometimes kind of take second place to the academics. But if anything, attending this conference has taught me um, people are interested in learning more about SEL. I've heard so many tutor presentations this weekend about that. So don't forget about it. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah.